Hello everybody. Alright, welcome to my third installment in a series on my experiences with the Wallstead method. And this one this third video is going to again talk about plants as water purifiers, uh, specifically around ammonia and nitrites. Now, if you haven't seen the first two videos, uh, I highly suggest you go back and watch them. Uh, I try to build on the previous videos in terms of information that I talk about and terminology, especially in the introduction video. So if you haven't seen it, uh, go ahead and take a look there. I, I go over the basics of, of the Wallstead method and, and, and how I understand it to work, uh, as well as uh, some scientific terms and things like that around pH and what it means, things of that nature. Uh, so it'll probably be pretty helpful. But uh, if you already know a lot about that, then great. Uh, go ahead and keep listening. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, plants as uh, water purifiers. This is the second part around plants as water purifiers. The first one uh, dealt specifically with metal toxicity. Uh, but ammonia nitrates is a little bit more specific to probably what most people experience when it comes to uh, uh, chemicals in the aquarium that we have to deal with. So ammonia is probably one of the most important topics on our minds, right? Uh, ammonia is, if you're not familiar with it, it's a toxic chemical produced by uh, fish and bacteria uh, as a waste product. So as fish, fecal matter, as well as uh, bacterial processes, all those tend to release uh, ammonia. Um, there's another non-toxic form that you may, may or may not have heard of called ammonium, and, which will not harm fish. And it's often found in equal amounts with ammonia. Uh, so ammonia and ammonium, as well as commonly stored in plants as part of the photosynthetic process. Uh, we'll, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. Now, if you remember in the last video, I mentioned that with heavy metals, the toxicity um, generally increases as the water becomes softer. So as the water becomes more acidic, it tends to leach more uh, metal toxins into the, into the water. Uh, and that's mainly due to the sort of the lack of buff, buffering uh, or binding by dissolved organic carbon, car carbon as well, or DOCs. Uh, ammonia toxicity is also linked to pH in the water. Uh, and comes, becomes increasingly toxic as the pH rises above seven or, or neutral. Um, the toxicity of ammonia actually tends to increase, I think it's roughly tenfold for each unit of pH increase uh, because the chemical interaction is with a base. So ammonia is interacting with a base, which in this case is hydrogen. Uh, so if you remember again, potential for hydrogen or pH in the water. Uh, why? Well, if you remember, as I said, pH stands for potential hydrogen, and the degree to which ammonia forms the non-toxic ammonium depends on the pH of the solution. So if the pH is low, then the balance of ammonia and ammonium shifts, and you end up with more ammonia molecules, which are converted into ammonium ions. If the pH is high, in other words, the concentration of, of hydrogen is, it, ions are, is low. The equilibrium shifts in the opposite direction, and attracting a proton from the ammonium ion, it's breaking the ammonium bond, producing the more toxic ammonia. Uh, simply put, because I know that was kind of, you know, a little bit on the, on the heavy side, and I try to stay away from it, but it's a, it's a good example. Um, you might have equal parts of ammonia and ammonium, the toxic and the non-toxic, in water with a pH of 7. But as the water softens, it converts more ammonia to ammonium, which is safe. As the water hardens, or goes above 7, it converts more ammonium to ammonia, right? So that's the good way to, that's the good way to remember it. So you'll, you'll have, there will be a balance, but it'll be more in one direction or the other as you move away from neutral water in either direction. Uh, you know, ammonia poisoning, uh, uh, if you're not familiar with keeping fish tanks, you're watching this for the first time trying to learn, ammonia poisoning is probably one of the biggest killers of aquarium fish, uh, and believe it or not, even plants in a, in a naturally planted tank. Uh, it occurs most often when a tank is newly set up, 
we see a lot of ammonia buildup in a tank as it's as it's beginning to cycle. Um, if you're not familiar with cycle, I'll talk a little bit about it, but uh, there are other articles out there that talk about the nitrogen cycle and cycling tanks in general. I'm not going to cover that here specifically. Uh, <clears throat> but we see it a lot of times uh, in newly set up tanks, uh, but and to be honest with you, it can also occur in an established tank when too many fish have been added at one time, uh, if the filter fails due to maybe power or mechanical fil failure or uh, it hasn't been really cleaned in a while and, and, and it could be malfunctioning, clogged, uh, or bacterial colonies, which are a majority of the uh, ammonia converters, uh, die off due to maybe medication that you might use in treating your fish or a sudden change in water conditions. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot, a lot of that can have an effect on reintroducing or, you know, having what's called an ammonia spike in the tank. Uh, plants which we normally associate in the Wellstead method um, actually can vary in their tolerance of ammonia. So the, le and the levels of ammonia present in the aquarium can actually re reduce growth or even kill certain plants. Uh, I know a few of us out there have seen this, especially in newly established tanks that have not yet cycled. Um, you know, I, I personally saw this uh, occur with a tank I had cycled uh, where all the plants, mostly Ludwigia in that tank, were, were growing fine. Uh, then after a water change, I, I sort of failed to dechlorinate the water. Um, so yes, I make mistakes too, just like everybody else, and I killed off all my bacteria. Um, you know, I didn't really realize it at the time, uh, but I essentially restarted the tank, and it had to go through the ammonia cycle again. The ammonia built up, and the Ludwigia quickly melted. Uh, it was it was gone. I, I was I was really upset because uh, they were really nice pieces too, um, which I had harvested from another tank. Uh, luckily it did come back afterwards. Uh, Ludwigia was a little bit stronger, it's more robust of a plant. It melted, but the leaves quickly came back on the stems and, and uh, in a couple of weeks it, it looked pretty normal again. Um, you know, I've heard people say uh, when, they're, when they're putting dirt in their tanks or dirting a tank, um, you know, that it's excess nutrients from a freshly dirted aquarium is the culprit, but um, you know, I'm sort of gonna go ahead and, and, and disagree with that as, 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 as too much of a generalization. Um, you know, I've planted tanks after the tank has cycled and seen no real plant loss going weeks without a water change with, with a freshly dirted tank. Um, once it's cycled in, there's no ammonia in there. So in my opinion, the more specific reason is the ammonia present in a newly established dirt tank, not necessarily the excess nutrients as, as, as some people like to uh, uh, think is going on. Um, but I mean, degrees of sensitivity in plants vary and wide experiences with different plants does kind of help in this area, I think. Um, if you're starting a tank for the first time, like I was you know, some years ago, it, you don't have that deep experience, so you're just gonna have to learn and, and uh, sort of expect that you're gonna lose some plants. But uh, some plants are more sensitive, and it would seem that other plants that you might be familiar with being used to nutrient-rich waters would probably fare much better uh, plants like duckweed, for example, are excellent starter plants for, for a young tank. Um, hornwort, too, is also a very robust plant, and it's rootless, so you can float it. It's pretty easy uh, with really, really good, strong nutrient uptake. Uh, both of those plants, very good, uh, especially uh, duckweed having sort of an aerial advantage, which I'll, I'll talk about in a later thing, but basically it's, it's capable of uh, pulling in a lot more light. It's at the top of the tank. It's got some access to some rich CO2 uh, in the air itself, not necessarily uh, just in the water. So it's really good at processing those nutrients. Um, if you're new to aquatic plants, I know it could be challenging. So uh, to find out which plants are better than others to start a tank with, but forms are a good start. And I would also sort of defer to, you know, again, what we're talking about here, Diana Wallstead's book, The Ecology of the Planted Tank. And, and her advice uh, in that book as you read through it, if you're reading through it, and I highly recommend that you do. Uh, one, one of her comments is, is that she prefers to plant a diverse selection of plants and sort of let nature take its course. So if you're not familiar with a plant's capabilities, plant it and see. Or, you know, if it's a more expensive plant, wait until the tank is cycled and, you know, things have balanced out and, and, and then take it from there. At least you can rule out certain, certain deaths if the plant doesn't make it. Um, the core idea still remains the same. Plants will detoxify ammonia 
uh, without harm when reasonable amounts are present. That, that's, that's the end result of this. Uh, plants, what do plants do with the ammonia? Well, they're going to process it. They're going to store it or directly use the ammonia as part of their photosynthetic process. Um, they'll remove it from the water and, you know, along with plants, of course, don't forget your bacterial colonies, which are ever present attached to your dissolved organic content, your gravel, your filter media, if you're using filters, things of that nature <coughs> to, uh, excuse me, to process, to help process that ammonia and break it down. Um, the other, the other, the other, the other side to this, uh, another sort of harmful but but less discussed um, chemical in the water is uh, nitrites. Okay, that's uh, N I T R I T E S, not to be confused with nitrates, which is yet another chemical in the process uh, of the nitrogen cycle. So nitrates are another output of the bacterial process in the tank. Nitrates are are, are more toxic at low pH, uh, and often exist along the non-toxic nitrate, right, which is another final product of the nitrogen cycle. Uh, both of these chemicals act as nitrogen sources for plants, uh, and their uptake by plants, of course, further purifies the water. So, once again, plants are kicking in to, to, to do a lot of the heavy work and heavy lifting. Um, nitrogen sources themselves, the nitrite and the nitrates, uh, help support plant growth and through Things like uh, they use it to make vitamins, they use it to um, create cellular structures, things of that nature to help the plant grow. Uh, so a nitrogen deficient plant is generally small uh, and you will generally see slow development because it lacks the nitrogen necessary uh, to manufacture these structural and, and genetic materials. Um, but you might be more familiar with nitrogen production in the context of the nitrogen cycle which is often uh, referred to as cycling a tank. So again, as I said earlier in the video, um, I'm not gonna discuss it in great detail, but I, I do recommend that you go out and, and, and read an article or two on, on uh, the nitrogen cycle or tank cycling uh, to get a stronger idea of, of that process in, in detail. Um, <clears throat> so in the end, what I believe Wallstead is, is, is teaching us is that the hard work of frequent water changes, uh, large scale filtration, uh, vacuuming of gravel can all be pretty much reduced or eliminated by plants. So you take a look for yourself. You can be you can be the judge. You can judge my tank. Um, this tank has been up and running for almost a year now. I think it's uh, ten months now, right? That it's been up and running. Uh, I never vacuum the gravel, ever. I swear to you, I've never vacuumed this gravel, ever. Uh, I do some water changes on my tanks. Uh, with the wood in there to, to remove the yellow tannins roughly every two to three weeks. Uh, I'm getting good results now that the tank has matured and the, and the wood is, is, is kind of cured a little bit. I'm not getting as many tannins as, as fast, so I'm, I'm not doing as many water changes. I'm slowing down even more. Otherwise, I just top off the water that evaporates. Sometimes I'll do a 10% water change just because, you know, I, I want to reintroduce some, um, <clears throat> some fresh water into the system, but overall, very, very minimal. Um, you know, even after weeks without a water change, if I test my ammonia and my nitrite and nitrate levels, they're always zero parts per million. I, I have, I don't even worry about ammonia, uh, with the, even with the amount of fish that I have in there, I'm comfortable with the fact that I could add more fish in there if I didn't think it would look crowded and, and cluttered and stress out the fish themselves. Um, so really, I mean, you know, and, and, and honestly, I'll, I'll, here, I'll even, I'll even kind of zoom in a little bit on my gravel so you can see it really is just not what I would consider dirty um, never vacuum it never touch it <clears throat> I don't even disturb it to get it clean don't mess with it so again plants doing all the heavy lifting a lot of the detritus that falls to the bottom if the if the snails and the catfish don't eat it it will break down further into the dirt and help replenish some of the nutrients in the soil that the plants have already taken up. So, you know, these are all positive things in, in a natural cycle from what I, from what I experienced. So next video, uh, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into the plant aspect uh, and discuss something called allopathy. Um, if you've never heard of it, 
something I think it's something I think that proponents of planet tanks should be very aware of and familiar with. Um, it's a it's a it's a little discussed topic and a, and a little understood topic, uh, even even in general uh, scientific circles. But um, it's a fact that that plants can and do release chemicals to defend or even attack other plants. Uh, it happens in nature, but I believe it's actually magnified in aquariums uh, because of this of, a, of an enclosed space. Um, but it's one of those things that's you know it's basically impossible to see. But it can be yet another reason why certain plant combinations don't work well together. Um, there's been some documentation of people's personal experiences with different plant species. Um, you know, there's a lot of variables, so aliopathy is really really hard to put a finger on. Uh, you know, when you get a new plant, especially where the light conditions right, where the water conditions right, things of that nature. But it's yet another thing that I think people should be aware of and have an understanding of, so that they might be able to uh, to to target what plants they select, how they select them, things of that nature. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do, uh, give it a thumbs up, like it, um, share it out with your friends. Uh, Give me some feedback. If I can do it better, let me know how I can do it better. And uh, looking forward to doing the next video, which I promise will be a lot faster than it took me to do this video. Uh, but hope you appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Happy Aquariums.